Εγώ με τη σειρά μου να ευχαριστήσω θερμά το Οφθαλμολογικό Ινστιτούτο ΟΜΑ και ιδιαίτερα τον κύριο Δατσερή και το Ελληνικό Κολέγιο Οφθαλμολογίας για την πρόσκληση να συμμετάσχω σε αυτό το συνέδριο που πλέον έγινε θεσμός στην επιστημονική κοινότητα και να παρουσιάσω στα πλαίσια του συνεδρίου αυτού το πρώτο μου Διεθνές Κλινικό Φροντιστήριο Οφθαλμικής Οκολογίας. Ευελπιστούμε όλοι ότι τα θέματα του κλινικού φροντιστηρίου αντανακλούν τα ενδιαφέροντα και τους προβληματισμούς όλων των οφθαλμιάτρων κάθε υποξειδίκευση. Εμεί, σαν Έλληνε, έχουμε τη μεγάλη τιμή να έχουμε Έλληνε οφθαλμιάτρου με εξειδικεύση στην οφθαλμική ογκολογία, γνωστού καταξιωμένου παγκοσμίω, τον κύριο Γραγούδα, τον κύριο Ζωγράφο, τον κύριο Μπεχράκη, που τόσα χρόνια διέγραψαν μια πολύ μεγάλη πορεία στον χώρο τη οφθαλμική ογκολογία. Αν εμεί, η επόμενη γενιά των οφθαλμικών ογκολόγων, κατορθώσει να προσεγγίσει έστω και ελάχιστα ό,τι έχουν κάνει, θα είναι πολύ μεγάλο μα επίτευγμα. So, Uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you and formally open this conference. Uh, it's my distinct honor and high privilege to introduce you our very distinguished panelists, Dr. D'Amato, Dr. Kazu, Dr. Suati and Dr. Frenkel. Each of them pioneer in the field of ocular oncology. We are all hoping that we can bring together some valuable experience from some of the best ocular oncology centers in the world. We will be discussing today about choroidal melanoma, tumors of the fadus, about some of the eye cancers in children, about orbit tumors, and about tumors of the arterial segment. Unfortunately, Dr. Cohen, she can't join us today. She wasn't feeling very well, and unfortunately, she has admitted to the hospital. We are all wishing her a very speedy recovery, and hopefully, she will be able to join us in one of our next courses. Dr. Kazu kindly will cover also her topic. If you have any question, please type your question at the in the appropriate box, and at the end of each talk, I will ask the questions to the speaker. So, we are all very, very pleased today to have today Dr. Swati Kaliki from the famous LV Prasad Eye Institute. Dr. Kaliki heads the Orbit and Ocular Oncology Unit at LV Prasad Eye Institute. She is the recipient of over 150 papers, eight chapters on various ocular tumors. She is also the recipient of Achievement Award from American Academy of Ophthalmology in 2014, and in 2019, she was shortlisted among the top three finalists at the Women in Science Award category from Young Scientist Awards 2019. Congrats. <laughs> uh, Dr. Kaliki is going to talk to us today about um, uh, the approach to pediatric proptosis. So I to thank you very much for accepting my invitation. I know it's too late in India. Please, let's give her a very warm virtual welcome to Swati. Over to you. Thank you very much, Maria, first of all, for organizing this uh, oncology conference in Greece and uh, making me a part of uh, the conference today. Um, a very good evening to everyone there in Greece and uh, to everyone who is logged in uh, to um, uh, listen to the wonderful talks that I'm sure that will be there uh, throughout the conference. So I'll start sharing my screen. Okay, so I will be talking about the orbital tumors in children specifically. I'll be showing you a couple of cases uh, so that we uh, have a greater understanding about the orbital tumors in children. I do not have any financial disclosures to make and uh, full face clinical photographs will be used in my presentation and uh, appropriate permission has been obtained from the patients. We'll start with this case number one. So this is a child, a three-year-old uh, child, a five-year-old child who presented with history of pain, redness, swelling, and proptosis that is very much visible in the right eye for the past four days. There was some vague history of trauma that the parents were giving, but there was no history of fever that could be noted. 
On examination, the child did not have any vision in the right eye, while the left eye was normal. There were obviously signs of inflammation that were present in the right eye. So whenever we have a, a cellulitis like picture in a child, we should not assume that it is a cellulitis of infectious etiology. Because as you can see in this child, this is the CT image that the, that the parents were carrying along with them. And here we can see that there is an intraocular mass in both eyes, in fact, but more so in the right eye with calcification in the center. And in the left eye, you can see that nasally there is an intraocular tumor. And this is the B scan of the same child. And it can be, it is very clear that there is an intraocular mass that is present in the right eye with areas of calcification showing the posterior shadowing wherever there are areas of calcification. So this in fact is a case of bilateral retinoblastoma which was mimicking an infectious orbital cellulitis but it is not an orbital cellulitis but it is right orbital pseudocellulitis. So pseudocellulitis in a case of retinoblastoma is not a very common picture that we see but we do see these cases in about 1% of the cases where the tumor undergoes necrosis and it causes inflammation of the orbital tissue. So how do we go about managing these cases? So these children do not require oral antibiotics, but they require intravenous steroids. So intravenous steroids are given for about 48 hours. And once the inflammation subsides, and if the child does not have any extraocular extension, we go ahead with enucleation of the right eye. And of course, the child also requires treatment for the left eye because the tumor is bilateral. So this is what was done in this child uh, so that the right eye, what you're seeing is a prosthetic eye where enucleation has been done and a prosthesis has been placed. And the left eye, the tumor is controlled with chemotherapy and focal treatment. So the clinical pearl that we have to take from this case is that whenever um, there is no fundus view or for the child, it is very important to do an orbital or ocular imaging so that we do not miss any intraocular tumor. Because most of the times what happens is these children come to the emergency and they may be misdiagnosed as infectious etiology and just put on antibiotics and the whole, the main etiology itself is lost. So that is why fundus examination is mandatory. If fundus examination is not possible, then at least an imaging should be done. Let's move on to case number two. Now, this is a child who presented with redness. So this is a one-year-old child who presented with redness, swelling, and proptosis of the right eye for the past one month. Again, there was some vague history of trauma. There was no clear-cut history there, and no, there was no history of any fever. This child, in fact, was diagnosed as the child had visited a pediatrician before coming to us. And uh, the child was diagnosed to have maybe an eyelid infection or inflammation and the child was already on antibiotics. But is this really an infection or inflammation? This is what the child had on imaging. So this is the MRI orbit. And you can see that the left orbit looks absolutely normal. But the right orbit, there is ill-defined heterogeneous lesion that is present, which is not just uh, present in the eyelid, but it is extending into the orbital tissues as well. And this can be even better appreciated with this contrast scan, as it can be seen that the entire lesion is just lighting up with this contrast. So in fact, this was a case of capillary hemangioma, the infantile hemangioma that the child had, and it was not an infectious etiology. So how do we go about treating these cases? 
So first we uh, get a physician review just to make sure that the child does not have any contraindications uh, to the treatment that we would offer to this child. The first line of management of the infantile capillary hemangioma now, nowadays is the oral beta blockers, specifically oral propranolol that we give for them. We give them at a dose of one milligram per kg body weight for a week. And once they tolerate the drug well, we escalate the dose to two milligram per kg body weight and we continue the treatment till the desired effect is attained. And then slowly we taper them and then stop. We do not stop them abruptly. If we stop the treatment abruptly, then these uh, children will have rebound phenomenon and the lesion may reappear again. That's why we do a very slow taper. This is the same child after treatment and you can see that the lesion has completely regressed and there is no uh, residual lesion that is present in the right eye. Now, this is another example. This is again a capillary hemangioma, the infantile hemangioma that is present. But here it is much more diffuse. So you can see that it is affecting almost the, the right half of the face. And even in the periauricular area, there is a swelling that is present, indicating that there is a deeper component as well. Now, uh, this is the uh, imaging of the same child, and this is the contrast MRI, and it can be seen that there is extensive lesion that is present in the right orbit and in the right preceptal space. And this is the same child after initiating treatment, and you can see that there is minimal residual lesion now, which would disappear with age. Um, it's not that all cases require treatment, but whenever it is causing significant ptosis, or if it is inducing astigmatism, these patients require treatment. Moving on to case number three. Now, this is a child who presented with left eye proptosis. The right eye was absolutely normal, a four-year-old girl. And the child also had pain in the left eye for the past three days. There was no history of trauma or any fever that was noted. And this is on imaging. This is the CT scan where we can see that the right orbit is normal, while in the left orbit, there is diffuse, ill-defined lesion, which is in the intraconal and the extraconal space. Now, this is a case of left orbital venolymphatic malformation, or what we commonly call it as lymphangioma. So now the first line management of these lymphangiomas or the venolymphatic malformations are sclerotherapy. Previously, in the previous, like, you know, maybe five or six years back, we used to go ahead and do surgery for these patients. But nowadays, with the advent of sclerotherapy, we do not require any extensive surgery in them. So what we did for this child was sclerotherapy with bleomycin. This is the sclerosing agent that was used in this case. And you can see that the result is very good where the lesion has completely disappeared. This child, we had to just give uh, two injections of bleomycin with an interval of two months and the lesion completely disappeared. Moving on to case number four. Now, this is a child who presented with proptosis of the right eye for the past one month. He had history of fever on and off and there was no history of trauma, though there is a small abrasion like that can be seen below the left lower lid, but the parents did not give any history of trauma. And on examination, his vision in the right eye was 2040 and in the left eye was normal being 2020. And we could palpate that there was a firm palpable mass that was present in the right orbit. Now, this is the imaging that was done. So this is the CT scan of the same child. And it can be seen that there is a more homogeneous isodense mass that is present in the right orbit, which is involving the extraconal and the intraconal space. And the lesion is also present in the left orbit, though it is not as, as prominent as in the right eye, but the lesion is bilateral. Now, whenever we see such homogeneous lesions in a child, we have to suspect that this could be a case of granulocytic sarcoma, which was what was in this child. That means this is leukemia, which uh, where, where there is infiltration of leukemic, there are leukemic deposits in the orbit, what we call as the chloroma or the granulocytic sarcoma. 
Now, what will we do next? Do we do biopsy in, the, in, in this child? No, we do not have to do biopsy in these children. First thing that we have to do is do a peripheral blood smear. So which was what was done in this child the, and the peripheral blood smear revealed that there are blasts that are present in the peripheral blood smear. And um, these cases, we really do not have to do biopsy to prove the diagnosis. So we already know that this is a case of acute leukemia. So uh, this child, in fact, had acute myeloid leukemia and um, the child was started on appropriate systemic chemotherapy. So the clinical pearl here is that whenever you see rapid onset of proptosis with a bilateral soft tissue homogeneous lesion in a child, suspect granulocytic sarcoma. Before we jump in to uh, like, you know, do an incisional biopsy based on the CT or MRI findings, we have to do a peripheral blood smear and we could arrive at a diagnosis by the most non-invasive method uh, by just doing a blood test. Moving on to case number five. Now this is a child who presented with uh, an eight year old boy who presented with proptosis of the left eye for the past 20 days. And he was diagnosed to have a non-specific orbital inflammatory disease elsewhere. He was seen elsewhere and he was diagnosed to have uh, orbital inflammatory disease and he was put on oral steroids for the same. But the father noticed that the proptosis was just progressing and the child was referred to us. On examination, the child had a vision of 2030 in the right eye and 2125 in the left eye. And on palpation, there was a firm palpable mass in the left orbit. And this is the CT scan of the child. And you can see that, that uh, there is a homogeneous, a well-defined mass that is present in the lacrimal gland area, which is extending almost till the apex of the orbit. So with this, with this picture, we made a differential diagnosis of granulocytic sarcoma, just like what we saw in the previous case. So we thought this could be a granulocytic sarcoma. And we also kept a differential diagnosis of rhabdomyosarcoma. So first we went ahead and because we had a diagnosis of granulocytic sarcoma, we did a peripheral blood smear and the peripheral blood smear was absolutely normal. So we went ahead. Uh, so we thought, okay, this doesn't look like granulocytic sarcoma. And then we went ahead and did a biopsy in this child. And on biopsy, it can be seen that there are large uh, cells that are present with, um, with large nucleus and um, uh, like you no know, high mitotic figures that were noted, but Desmond stain was negative and myo D1 was also negative, indicating that this is not arising from the muscle. So this was not rhabdomyo uh, sarcoma. But myeloperoxidase stain was positive, indicating that it is a acute myeloid leukemia and the bone marrow showed that there were in fact blasts that were present which was not evident on peripheral blood smear. So uh, initially we had ruled out granulocytic sarcoma but by histopathology we came to a diagnosis that it is indeed a case of granulocytic sarcoma. So this was a case of again AML that is acute myeloid leukemia and the child was put on appropriate chemotherapy. Now, the pearl here is that sometimes the peripheral blood smear may be negative, even though it is a case of acute leukemia. So negative peripheral blood smear does not rule out granulocytic sarcoma. The child can have what we call as a leukemic leukemia. So a leukemic leukemia is a type of leukemia where the peripheral blood smear, it remains normal. The changes would be seen only in the bone marrow. So the peripheral blood smear may not be helpful in such cases. Moving on to case number six. So this is a child who presented with a, a painless proptosis of the left eye since two months. There was no history of fever or, or trauma. And this is the CT image of the same child where it can be seen that the right eye is normal while in the left orbit, there is a well-defined lesion that is present in the lateral orbit. Um, and in fact, the part of the spinoid bone was also missing in this, but the dura was intact. There was no intracranial extension. So with this uh, clinical picture and the imaging, we came to a differential diagnosis of that it could be a case of Langerhans cell histiocytosis or eosinophilic granuloma or a case of primitive neurecto neuro neurectodermal tumor or um, the Ewing sarcoma. 
we went ahead and did an uh, incisional biopsy in this case and it can be seen that there are large polygonal cells with abundant eosinophilic uh, cytoplasm that is present within the cells the cd68 was positive s100 was positive indicating the histiocytic origin of this lesion and cd1a was strongly positive so whenever CD1A is positive, it is pathognomonic of Langerhans cell histiocytosis or eosinophilic granuloma. So this is what this child had. Now, how do we go about and treat this case? Now, whenever we see a case of eosinophilic granuloma, it is very important to do a systemic workup, including bone marrow biopsy, a bone scan, complete blood picture and whole body PET CT. And also we should rule out diabetes insipidus because these children have tendency to develop diabetes insipidus. And the, the way we treat this is if it is isolated or vital lesion, we can do intralesional steroids. And if it is multifocal involvement, then these patients also require systemic chemotherapy. So this child, we gave intralesional steroids. The six weekly intralesional steroids was given in the Kennecott was given for this child. And you can see that um, with two injections, the lesion nicely regressed. And when we do a repeat CT after say about six months, the bone also would have reformed. Now, this is another child who presented with proptosis of the right eye. And there was no history of fever or trauma. And this is the CT picture where we can see that there are multifocal lesions. Well, in, um, you can see one lesion in the right orbit. And even in the skull bones, there, uh, there is a osteolytic lesion that is noted. This child, in fact, had multifocal eosinophilic granuloma or the multifocal Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So this particular child required oral steroids and systemic chemotherapy. So this is the child after one cycle of chemotherapy. Um, and this child is still on uh, treatment as of now. Moving on to case number seven. Uh, now, this is a child who presented with a painless proptosis of the left eye since one month in the left eye. Um, there was no history of fever or trauma that could be noted. And on MRI, there was a large mass that was present in the left orbit, which was pushing the globe forwards. With this, we made a clinical diagnosis of rhabdomyosarcoma because it was a child in the first decade of life and there was rapid increase in the size of the lesion and imaging showed that there is a well-defined lesion. So we, uh, with this um, in mind, we made a diagnosis of rhabdomyosarcoma. A systemic workup is indicated in these cases, which includes a bone marrow biopsy and a whole body PET CT to see if there is any systemic metastasis. Um, uh, in this child, we went ahead and did a swinging eyelid approach to remove the orbital tumor, that is the transconjunctival. Um, what you see in dotted lines is the transconjunctival incision we gave. And then we did a lateral canthotomy and cantholysis. And we could remove the tumor in total. This is the tumor that has been removed a fairly large uh, lesion that we could remove. Uh, grossly, there was no residual tumor that was left behind. And this, was, this is the histopathology picture where there is a capsule that is present and it is densely packed uh, cells that can be noted uh, with the high mitosis rate. Um, here you can see a high MAC picture where um, it, it is arranged in fascicles and there, are, there is a lot of mitosis that is visible on this uh, picture. Now, Desmond was strongly positive in this case, and MyoD1 again was strongly positive. Wymentin also positive, indicating that this is a case of embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. So whenever we see a case of rhabdomyosarcoma, we have to determine what type of RMS it is, whether it is embryonal, botryoid, spindle cell, alveolar, or pleomorphic. It is important because botryoid and spindle cell rhabdomyosarcoma have a good prognosis, Embryonal has an intermediate prognosis, while alveolar and pleomorphic have poor prognosis. And also, it is important to determine uh, what stage it belongs to because the treatment varies. If complete resection has been obtained and the lesion is well encapsulated, then we can simply observe. But if there is microscopic residual disease or the lymph nodes are involved, then they require chemotherapy and um, the radiotherapy. Stage three, again, they require a combination treatment, while stage four requires palliative care. 
The clinical pearl here is that whenever orbital rhabdomyosarcoma is suspected, aim for complete surgical excision of the lesion because this improves the survi survival rate. Avoid only incisional biopsy. Excisional biopsy should always be aimed whenever RMS is suspected. So this is the same child where we excised and also this child also received chemotherapy because there was suspected microscopic disease. So to summarize whatever I've spoken now, whenever it is a case of pediatric proptosis or where there, where there is an orbital tumor in a child, we have to look at various factors. What is the age of the child, laterality of the disease, whether it is acute or chronic onset, progressive or non-progressive lesion, get an imaging of the orbit, CT or MRI, whatever is available. And uh, systemic screening is important in certain conditions, like I have discussed certain cases. And we have to plan whether this uh, particular orbital tumor requires excisional biopsy or an incisional biopsy, or just a medical treatment is sufficient. With this, I end my talk. So here is my email ID if any of you have any additional questions or you want to reach out, you can certainly send me an email. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Sati, for the wonderful talk. As always, your talks are very, very interesting. <laughs> we Thank always were speaking your cases. And um, I have a question for you. Um, in cases of babies with a lesion similar to dermolipoma, when we have the lesion um, when it has features similar to orbital fat on um, CT or on MRI, what would you do? Would you just wash the lesion? Would you remove the lesion? If the lesion is large, when would you remove the lesion if you had to remove the lesion? Yeah, so whenever uh, we have a case of dermolipoma in a child, which is a fairly uh, common thing that we see, mm -hmm. we can either observe Mm -hmm. Not always that we have to excise. So if it is a small lesion hidden beneath the eyelid and you do not see the lesion unless you actually elevate the eyelid, then such cases we can simply observe. We don't have to remove them. Mm -hmm. But if it is large, if it is um, uh, like, you know, large enough that it is seen uh, in the palpebral aperture, or if the child is having difficulty because of that, um, like, you know, when I say difficulty, that means like, you know, there could be problem with the tear film not being spread evenly because when the eyelid kind of closes, um, there will be a dry spot there. If it is that large, only then we advise excisional biopsy. So in all cases of dermolipomas do not require excision. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. I know that it was very late in India. So thank you very much. I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Right. So it's uh, my very great pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Natalie Cazou. Uh, Dr. Cazou is a full professor in ophthalmology in Paris and head of the Ocular Oncology Unit uh, at Institute Curie. She is also president of our European Ocular Oncology Group. She is always organizing several international multicentric studies and um, among the other things devoted uh, mostly to uval melanoma and retinoblastoma research. She has written more than 130 published articles and she received also the American Academy of Ophthalmology Prize. Um, Dr. Kazu, at her first talk, she will speak to us about the management of UV melanoma. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Natalie Kazu. You, Natalie. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello. So nice Calibera. to see you again. Calibera. <laughs> Calispera. Uh, just to say that uh, I, I am not the, the president of the OOG, I'm the past president. Thanks. Like, okay. <laughs> you go uh, ahead. The, the first talk is actually, I think, uh, the first talk is the, the retinoblastoma one. Okay, perfect. It's also so if, this one. Okay. It's, if it's okay so for it's you. It's about the retinoblastoma, and we are really hope in Greece, in the near future, we will be able finally to treat cases of retinoblastoma also in Greece. So we are all listening to you. <laughs> so uh, we are going to see the, some guidelines for diagnosis and the, the conservative management of retinoblastoma, okay. Cons conservative or not conservative. Okay. Uh, at, at the Institute Curie, the first treatment of retinoblastoma started in the, many years ago with the start of external beam radiotherapy mm -hmm. by Dr. Dolphus at that time. And 20 years uh, ago, after a decision of French government,
It's okay. It's okay now. So uh, retinoblastoma is a rare pediatric cancer with a relative stable incidence. Uh, this disease is due to a double hit on the gene of retinoblastoma gene, and it follows the what we call the the customs uh, cut, cutstone model. Uh, this nice paper, paper uh, that was done by F Didi Fabian and uh, all the the team uh, showed that there is a huge disparity between Europe and Africa, for example. Uh, in Europe, the, the child are younger uh, and the presentation is less advanced than in Africa patients. And of course, the survival is to also totally different. So for some, some ge simple genetic, uh, the unilateral form is due to uh, a first hit in one cell, in, in one retin uh, retinal cell, and then the double hit would give you one tumor in one eye. The sporadic or familial retinoblastoma, which is uh, with the, 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 the boy is carrying, uh, or the girl, a germinal mutation of retino, on the retinoblastoma gene. All the uh, retinal, retinal cells carry one hit, and then a second hit can occur uh, in a different point of one eye or two eyes, and you have a bilateral retinoblastoma with more than one tumor per eye. The first clinical symptoms are the, the early one is leukocoria and unilateral strabismus. And uh, the European uh, presentation is usually uh, the early presentation. Sometimes you can see more late uh, presentation with bifthalmia, neovascular glaucoma, pain, and very rarely phthisis bulby. And you have also an advanced presentations, proptosis with regional lymph node metastasis and present metast systemic metastasis. So this is a case of leukocoria. Uh, leukocoria is easy to see with uh, the, the pictures on the smartphone. And of course, in case of uh, leukocaria, uh, the child needs a complete examination with the fundus uh, and an ultrasonography and an MRI. Is it the same for strabismus? You do not take a permanent strabismus for an accommodative strabismus. And the, the rule is that every uh, children ch child with a, Strabismus need a complete examination of the fundus. This is another case of leukocoria. So as I said, there is two presentation, unilateral form and the, uh, the, the bilateral form. Uh, the unilateral form are gen usually uh, diagnosed a little bit later than the bilateral form. Here you can see a big uh, white mass with a retinal detachment and an invasion of the vitreous beta tumoral cells. And in this case, you have a bilateral form with many tumors, uh, five in the right eye and two in the left eye. And the tumor are characteristic, white, and uh, with a bit of classification inside. Another example of a big tumor with a vitreous invasion. It is another form with uh, when, when the tumor is associated with retinal detachment. And this can be uh, a pitfall because sometimes the presentation is, you, you, you can see only a complete retinal detachment and we, sometimes you cannot see the, the tumor. So, even in, in uh, a child, you need to, to explore a total retinal detachment uh, if unilateral, because it's very rare to have a retinal detachment uh, traumatic, for example, uh, in, a, in a children of less than two, two years old. So stay vigilant uh, in case of total retinal detachment, in case of unilateral neovascular glaucoma, in case of unilateral bifthalmia, uh, unilateral intravitreal hemorrhage, Sometimes this can be 
also pseudocellulitis or a pseudo hypopion. This is a case, uh, the, the child presented a total retinal detachment uh, that was diagnosed at the beginning as traumatic. Uh, but finally, he had an exploration with an MRI and you can see that there is a big uh, tumor inside the eye and also in, in ultrasound with calcifications, which is a, a classic for retinal blastoma. This is also a poor, uh, poor child that was followed during two years for traumatic retinal detachment. And you see that there is a tumor inside the eye and during the two years, the tumor evolved. And there is here uh, an extra scleric extension, an invasion of the optic nerve to the chiasma. You sometimes you have also some inflammatory presentation like uh, this, you know, there is eyelid edema. And uh, in this case, you can see that there is a sort of, of inflammation, but you see here that there is a, a sort of hippopion with a cataract, but this hippopion is not like uh, an inflammatory hippopion because if you move the eye, you will see the hippopion with, will, will move with the ocular of movement. And this is a sign of cellular hippopion. And this is a retinal blastoma. And in this case, there is a total retinal det detachment. And if you do uh, an ultrasonic echography, you will see the tumor. Another case of a uh, neo neovascular glaucoma with biftalbia, and in, in generally it's unilateral. This is more advanced uh, cases with the proptosis. And this proptosis is, is due to a uh, huge exteriorization of the tumor inside the orbit. And you can see that this child have had a bilateral retinoblastoma. This is also a young uh, patient that came from uh, Africa with uh, this huge proptosis. Uh, you see here, there is an invasion of the soft tissue of the orbit end of the face. There is lymph node metastasis and the systemic metastasis. And despite uh, uh, huge treatment with uh, systemic chemotherapy, unfortunately, these uh, children didn't, didn't survive. This is the Im imaging of the, in, la, the vast in, invasion of the soft tissue of the face. Another pitfall is a diffuse infilt infiltrating retinoblastoma, when tumor cells can invade the retina and the vitreous and the entire chamber without a uh, clear mass. There is a generally a retinal detachment, vitreous seeding, and then hypopion. But you see that the vitreous seeding is, 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 is unusual. It is very white with a sort of a snowballs, uh, in the a bit of infiltration of the retina. This is another example of this kind of hypopion, which is cellular hypopion that moving with the high movement. Well, it's very important to, do the, to make a diagnosis because it's completely forbidden to do a vitrect, diagnostic vitrectomy or any uh, intraocular surgery. This is the imaging. You can see that the retina is thick without a clear mass. Uh, what we are going to see more and more in Europe is the family retinoblastoma. Uh, here you can see a family, the, the father, the mother that was treated at, at Curie for retinoblastoma, and she had two, uh, a boy and a girl, and the, the two uh, children were affected by retinoblastoma. It's very important in case of familiar retinoblastoma to do, to do an ophthalmology screening at birth. If there is a lesion, you can give an immediate treatment. If the fundus look normal, it's also very important to have a no CT uh, to see if there is a small uh, non-visible uh, tumor. And if you not, don't have any, uh, the pediatric OCT, you need to control the fundus mo one month after and every month. Here you can see a familial retinoblastoma with two, uh, it is a fundus at birth. You have two tumors in the right eye and one tumor in the left eye. And you can treat immediately this lesion with the thermotherapy. 
here you, you can see the, this case. You can see nothing on the picture. And then in, in, when, in, when you do the fences, you see that there is something strange here. It's also a reflex. And when you do the CT, you can see that there is two little tumor uh, on the, the retinal layer. And you can do the, the thermotherapy transpupillary ther thermotherapy immediately. This is a child after the treatment. So there is a lot of classification, uh, international classification, uh, and the new uh, TNM. Uh, all these classifications are imperfect, uh, but you can combine the classification. And it's important to what kind of, tra tra of treatment we are going to, to give. Because the, the, the treatment is, uh, we said in France, à la carte, it's customized. Uh, it, in it, it, it's a uh, customized function of the age of the children, is it, if it is bilateral or unilateral, uh, if the, 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 the classification, etc. And there is also a big deal to define the, the objective of the treatment is first to save the life. Then if you can save the eyeball, and if possible, save the vision. But this objective, uh, don't you don't forget that the treatment had secondary side effects, and especially the irradiation, you have a higher risk of sarcoma in the in the radiation field, the aplasia due, due to chemotherapy, and disorganization of the family life, scolarity of the child, etc. We have a lot of treatment available, and more and more with the, the, the progress of the, the medicine. You have the non-conservative management, which is enucleation, with or without adjuvant chemotherapy, and conservative management with IV chemotherapy, thermotherapy transpupillary thermotherapy, thermotherapy plus carboplatin, cryo, cryo application, intra-arterial of chemotherapy, intravitreal of chemotherapy, brachytherapy, but we tried to no more use uh, the external beam radiotherapy because of the risk of sarcoma in the field. In case of unilateral retinoblastoma, if it is a very advanced case, it's probably better to do an enucleation. If it is a patient that have a Potential, the, the vision is, is not treated. You can you think you can save the globe. You can try a conservative management. So what is very important is to do an MRI before the surgery to see if there is any infiltration of the optic nerve. Uh, you cannot see clinically, of course. And also to rule out the pinealoblastoma pineal, pineal, pineal like here. And here you can see that the, there is an advanced case with the, the eye is full of tumor. And there is an infiltration of the optic nerve uh, that end near the chiasm. And these uh, patients need to be enucleated with neurosurgeon to cut the optic nerve as far as possible from the infiltration. In advanced retinoblastoma, Sometimes you need, to, you need to give neoadjuvant chemotherapy before enucleation. And if you give neoadjuvant chemotherapy before enucleation, you need to continue the chemotherapy after the enucleation. Because the chemotherapy can uh, influence the histologic risk factor, uh, of course, because the chemotherapy will decrease the size of the tumor. If you do the enucleation without chemo, then you look at the globe in, uh, on, on histopathology. If there is no risk factor of metastasis, you have nothing to do more. If there is some histologic risk factor, then you need to do an adjuvant chemotherapy after the enucleation. This is some examples of uh, advanced retinoblastoma. The surgical technique is very important because the goal uh, is to remove the eyeball without perforating the sclera and obtain at least 10 millimeter of optic nerve. And to obtain uh, this uh, long optic nerve, the best instrument is this snare. 
And with this nerve, you can obtain a long optic nerve. And after, of course, you can uh, uh, put uh, uh, some uh, hydroxyapatite or, or bioceramic inside the orbit. And you have a nice uh, cosmetic uh, results. When you look at the conservative management, you have the chemotherapy, you can give it uh, intravenously, intraarterially, or with intravitral injection. Radio, the radiotherapy, but as I, as I said, we try to not uh, to, to avoid the external beam uh, radiotherapy. But sometimes we need to put a plaque, and uh, the plaque is uh, is a good uh, treatment for some relapses. And we have also local treatment like uh, transpupillary thermotherapy, cryotherapy, etc. So in case of bilateral retinoblastoma, what we do in France is to start with IV chemo. And IV chemo must be uh, used with local treatment. If uh, the treatment is, uh, is fine, uh, you, you need to follow the, the patient. Sometimes you have relapse and you can use second line uh, treatments such, such as uh, intraarterial chemotherapy, intravitreal chemotherapy, uh, etc. Sometimes you need to remove one of the two eyes uh, when the, the second eye is clearly, uh, there is a persistent retinal de detachment, uh, intraocular hemorrhage complete, and you cannot see the fundus, etc. So <clears throat> the, the, the local treatment is transpupillary thermotherapy. You can use it alone if the tumor is small, like this. So no more than uh, two di the optic nerve diameter. You can also treat a uh, small tumor in the on the periphery with cryo. You see the, the tumor and the, the, the scar after the cryo. You can, if the tumor is, a, is too, too big to, to, to be treated only with TTT, you can use the combination of chemotherapy and TTT. And generally, you, you can use carboplatin plus TTT, or sometimes, if the tumor is very big, uh, the combination of drug plus TTT. This is another example of intraarterial chemotherapy plus thermotherapy, transpupillary thermotherapy. And also another, another example of intraarterial uh, chemotherapy associated with uh, transpupillary thermotherapy. Uh, if you have uh, an invasion of, of the, the vitreous, uh, the treatment, the, mo the most efficient treatment is intravitreal injection of uh, or melphalan or topotecan. Here you can see there is a tumor and you have an invasion of the vitreous. And this will be nicely treated with intravitreal injection of melphalan or topotecan or both. The intravitreal uh, injection of melphalan uh, have been uh, well described by Francis Munier. Uh, you need to do the, the, the injection very, with caution because you, it's very dangerous to, to see the uh, tumoral cells here with the needle. So you need to do an interchamber tap to decrease the interocular pressure, then inject the drug, and then do cryo uh, on the needle track. This is some example of a tumor that was treated with chemo. Then you have rela relapse in the vitreous, and the, this, this relapse was treated uh, nicely with intravitreal injection of melphalan. Here you can see also a relapse with two bubbles uh, of tumoral cells in the vitreous. And this is uh, easily treated uh, with uh, intravitreal inj injection. The other uh, treatment that was uh, quite recent is intratrial injection of melphalan. It was uh, described firstly by Japanese. Uh, in France, we use the intratrial injection of melphalan only if in unilateral retinoblastoma. 
or sometimes in very asymmetrical bilateral retinoblastoma. And uh, in unilateral retinoblastoma, we treat all the groups except the advanced cases, so the group E, uh, because there is, there is a, clearly a risk of micrometastasis if you treat with local regional, uh, an eye with, with local regional treatment, uh, you cannot treat the micrometastasis. So in very uh, advanced cases, I'm not, I don't think it's a very good idea. You can also use the intravit arterial mefalan as a second line in case of relapse. Of course, there is a, a huge advantage that it's less toxic than intravenous uh, chemo. But the inconvenient is that the, there is a clear vascular toxicity on the vessels of the choroid and, and the vessels of the retina. There is some uh, brain micro ischemic lesion, but it's very rare. But the main uh, issue is that, is that not, you don't treat the metastatic risk. Some example of intraarterial with a huge regression of the tumor. Another case. And then uh, after the treatment, you need to follow uh, carefully the, the child because it, the, the risk is to not to see the relapse. Here you have the, the first uh, lesion that was treated with intraarterial injection of melphalan plus uh, thermotherapy uh, TTT. And here you can see that there is the scar and you can see here that there is some relapses in the retina that need to be treated with a TTT. Uh, another example of treat treatment with intraarterial plus intravitreal injection of melphalan. There is a nice scar, but here you have a relapse on the border that need to, treat, that need to be treated as uh, quick as possible. So the, 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 the follow-up need to be close and prolonged every month during the first year under general anesthesia, then progressively tapered every th three months. And you can do the fundus without anesthesia generally after the age of four. And of course, you need to check uh, all the retina to the other arterata because the relapse generally occur uh, in the periphery of the retina. Here we have an example of uh, relapses diffuse relapses after the treatment of the, the, the first, we see the first tumor. And here you have some relapses that need to be treated uh, quickly. So in conclusion, it shall need to, to have a customized treatment depending on the, lateral, the laterality, the, the, the staging, the age, etc. Chemotherapy alone is, on, is often non-sufficient and uh, you need to, addition, to, to, put, to give also additional treatment like uh, cryo or TTT. The, there is a lot of uh, progress with the local, local, local regional treatment, but uh, to avoid uh, the external build radiotherapy, but you need to know that uh, this local regional tr treatment don't prevent the, the risk of micrometastasis. And of course, the child need to a close follow up after the treatment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie, for the wonderful talk. Um, I've got a question. Uh, in cases of condition that show similarities with retinoblastoma, uh, like codes, would you suggest MRI? And um, do you think it's necessary? And what do you think? Sometimes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, if the if the the cost the codes is a uh, non-advanced, it's easy to, to do the diagnosis because you have the telangiectasia mm -hmm. and the, the exudation is very, is yellow, it's not white. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you have a, a complete retinal detachment mm -hmm. and it looks like uh, retinoblastoma. Exactly. Uh, so in that case, you need uh, to, the, an echography and an MRI. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a thing that a, a paper is going to be published yes. by the group yeah. of... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, the, neuro, the, the neuroradiologist uh, with a sign to distinguish the, the retinal blastoma from the, uh, the advanced coats. Uh -huh. 
Okay. And at the end, sometime, uh, in cases we you cannot uh, really uh, make the difference between a retinoblastoma and a coat. Exactly. Uh, sometimes it's a once a year or every two years. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to do an enucleation and to explain to the parents that it's better to enucleate an eye with an, uh, an advanced coast that to let it roll mm -hmm. a retinoblastoma. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So let's go now to your next talk. Uh, you're going to speak about the management of uvel melanoma. If you have any questions, please type your questions in, your app in the appropriated box, and I'm going to ask the questions at the end of the talk. So, Natalie, to you for, your, for the next talk. Okay, so let's uh, see uh, the management of an another uh, ocular tumor in the adult. Uh, this time is the melanoma, uvel melanoma. So the treatment for ovarian melanoma, uh, you can use the combination of uh, radiotherapy or surgery or both. It's the same that the, all these techniques need to be tailored to the tumor size, location, extension, and patient situation and wishes. The treatment is also choose function of the country, health care resources, etc. What we know is that the risk of metastasis is not affected by what, the, what treatment you are going to choose, enucleation or irradiation. Uh, in France, we are organized in a national network uh, called Melaconat. And this network, the treatment follow uh, some national guidelines we have, uh, we have uh, wrote. It is exactly the same. Our first goal, because we are oncologists first, is to save the patient's life. And this is related to an early diagnosis, and we need to, to do a lot of enucleation of education of professionals. And it's one of the mission of uh, the, this uh, uh, French uh, network is to, to, learn, to, to do some many courses in France to, for the early diagnosis of, of melanoma. And uh, the patient need to be sent to a referral center for appropriate treatment. And if you can, we, we are going to try to save the patient eye by conservative management. And if possible, we are, uh, we let, we are trying to save the patient visual acuity. Uh, this old treatment, uh, that is the enucleation, is, remains necessary for advanced, advanced cases. What we mean by advanced cases is very large tumor associated with total retinal detachment or neovascular glaucoma or <clears throat> melanoma that infiltrate all the eyeball. There is a general tumor with a basal di diameter, uh, large basal diameter and a thickness over 10 millimeter. <clears throat> In this case, uh, Radiotherapy, either by plaque or proton beam, will be uh, associated with a large amount of complication. The eye will become blind and painful. You need to have also, you risk also to have relapses. So in this case, you need to discuss with the patient if he really, he really want a conservative management and and to after to have a lot of complication, or if he agreed to be to have an enucleation uh, that uh, will be cosmetically better uh, to do a first enucleation than to do a secondary enucleation af after irradiation. Here you can see that this, this is the, the risk of secondary enucleation uh, function of the um, following the, the following irradiation, depending on the, the thickness of the tumor. The more the tumor is thick, uh, the more the risk of uh, secondary enucleation is high. So this kind of big tumor, uh, you need to discuss frankly with the patients, to, because if you want to keep his eye, you will have a lot of problems. The uh, enucleation is exactly the same uh, that I uh, said uh, previously. We use a snake. 
And of course, we put uh, ceramic in the eye. For the conservative treatment, the, the first goal uh, of the, this conservative management is to obtain a local control. So to stop the evolution of the melanoma and perhaps prevent metastasis. I said perhaps because it's, it's impossible to prove. Uh, what is sure is that when you treat a, a small uh, melanoma, you have few metastases. And the, the bigger the tumor is, of course, the, the risk of metastasis increase. Uh, secondly, to preserve the eyeball and sight if possible. The treatment by, by air radiation induce uh, many side effects. And as I said, the complications are more frequent and more severe function of the tumor volume. So how to improve this eye preservation and sight? But at the same time, we need to stay efficient in terms of tumor control. And the melanoma is a tumor that is radioresistant. That we need to, to, to give a high dose of uh, irradiation to control the tumor. So first, the first step uh, is to customize the treatment. We, we need to, to decide if you are going to do a proton beam or a brachytherapy. And for brachytherapy, you have a different kind of plaques, iodine plaques, uh, retinium plaques, and uh, which is less uh, used, a palladium plaque, for example. The brachytherapy, uh, it's generally the, the, the radioisotope is, uh, here, for example, you have a seed of, of iode, and you can see that the seed irradiates uh, around him. If you put the seed in uh, gold, the irradiation, the irradiation will go uh, on, in the direction of the eye, and the gold will protect the lacrimal gland, the eyelid, etc. So this iodine plaque is surgically uh, sutured on the sclera and will irradiate the, the tumor. To destroy the melanoma, you need to put 90 gray uh, to, the, to, the, to the top. So you can see that the, the, the dose is not homogeneous to the tumor because you have uh, more and more irradiation when you uh, are near the, the sclera. This is one inconvenient of the brachytherapy. And the second inconvenient of brachytherapy, and especially with iodine, is that there is a diffusion laterally. And this diffusion, lateral diffusion, will increase the side effects. On the contrary, on the proton beam will give a homogeneous dose to the tumor because the tumor will be irradiate in the BRAG peak, in the mod modified BRAG, BRAG peak. And there is no diffusion uh, on the laterally. And this uh, will uh, decrease the side effects. The choice uh, is function of the position and the size of the tumor. The tumor that are located at the posterior pole the proton beam is the more efficient technique to my point of view. We know that uh, we, have, uh, we have done a study and we, are, we have shown that the, the, for T1 tumor located at the posterior pole, uh, we have 100% uh, of local control with proton beam and the preservation of the visual acuity when the tumor is located at more than three millimeters from the macula or the optic nerve. There is also a very, very big uh, study done by the Shields with brachytherapy. The visual results is not, uh, is not so bad, but it's not uh, as good as, uh, as uh, our results. And uh, what we can see, there is, there is more relapse with plaque. And I'll show you why, because uh, for all the tumors that are located at the posterior pole, it's very difficult to push the plaque and especially for tumors that are located uh, around the optic nerve or that invade the optic nerve, because e even with notch plaque, it's very difficult to, to, to irradiate uh, around the optic nerve. This kind of tumor also is very difficult to treat with the plaque. 
but it's easy to treat uh, this tumor with potent beam. This is an example of a melanoma that was treated with a plaque. And here you can see that there is a relapse that is due to the lack of treatment of probably one, this one or this, bo this border or this border of the tumor. So the advantage of the proton beam is, it is, is a target external beam radiotherapy. Uh, but because it's external beam radiotherapy, it's not indicated if the tumor is located in the temporal superior quadrant. Because in that case, you, you will irradiate the lacrimal gland and the patient can complain of severe dry eye. You, it's also impossible to do a, a proton beam if the patient is not compliant or if he has a dementia or some psychiatric uh, issues. And the other point is that the more the tumor is sick, the more you can face uh, a toxic syndrome. This toxic syndrome is due to necrosis of the tumor that increase the retinal detachment or give a retinal detachment that can be total. And the patient can develop a neovascular glaucoma. Here you can, you can see in this uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, then uh, the more uh, the tumor is thick, the more you have a risk of neovascular glaucoma. To uh, prevent this uh, toxic syndrome, you can combine the proton beam with uh, surgery, that is an endoresection of the scar. It's a uh, three posts per plana vitrectomy. Then you remove the tumor and you do laser and you put si silicone oil inside the eye. But it, it's, for me, it's important to do the endoresection endo after the, the the destruction of the tumoral cells by proton beam. You need to inactivate uh, the tumoral cells. And this surgery decreases the risk of neovascular glaucoma and the risk of secondary enucleation. This is an example of very big melanoma. You, the, the top is a uh, mask, the posterior pole. After proton beam plus endoresection of the tumor, here you, you can see there is a coloboma uh, and the, the posterior pole is, uh, is, is perfect and the patient has good vision. This is another case of a big tumor that was treated with proton beam, then endoresection of the scar. You see here this is a sclera, the coloboma due to rem the removal of the tumor and the, everything uh, and the retina, et cetera. But in this case, the, the visual acuity is not so good because the bacula was irradiated with the tumor. You can also combine other adjuvant treatment, such as intravitreal injection of NT uh, VEGF plus uh, photocoagulation of, uh, with laser. Here you can see that this patient need something because he, had, uh, he was treated for this uh, small uh, tumor. And you can see that there is uh, many signs of uh, uh, irradiation or retinopathy. And in this uh, patient, the tumor is uh, very well controlled. The patient get his, his laser with intravitreal injection. He didn't develop any glaucoma, but the, visual, the vision is not so good because there is, of course, um, irradiation of the macula. This is another example. See that this is a small melanoma, and after radiation, we know now with that there is a, an occlusion of the capillary of the retina uh, in all the layer. And in this case, you can see that there is also an ischemia of the choroid, plus a very huge occlusion of all the capillaries of the retina. Ah, sorry, I didn't translate. Uh, so what we uh, this, what we choose is if, if the, me, the the melanoma is located at the posterior pole, we are using, using proton beam. If the pa the, the patient is non-compliant or if the the it's not it's not possible to put a plaque, 
uh, it's not possible to put the patients uh, at the proton beam facility, we, we, we can use a, a plaque. If the, the melanoma is, is anterior to the, is the equator, we can use proton beam except if the location is temporal, superior temporally. And in that case, we put a plaque. Uh, if the tumor is less than six millimeter, you can use a retinium plaque or a iodine, a iodine plaque. But if the tumor, the tumor is, is over six, six millimeter in thickness, uh, the retinium is can can be uh, not non, not enough uh, not and not, su not sufficient. So it's better to use the iod the iodine. This is a difference between uh, an iodine plaque and a retinium plaque. This is gold, this is silver, but this, this is not the, the main point. You can see that this is, uh, uh, here you have the dosimetry of the retinium and here you have the dosimetry of the iodine plaque. You see that this with iodine plaque, you have uh, an irradiation that is more important in depth. That's why you can irradiate a tumor uh, until 10 millimeters in, in thickness. But the, the inconvenient is the, in the, that there is laterally a lot of irradiation and that increases the toxicity. For the retinium plaque, uh, the depth of irradiation is less important. That's why you cannot irradiate tumors of more than six, seven, seven millimeters. But the toxicity is less important because the, the, the lateral irradiation is less important. This is an example of an iodine plaque uh, that was uh, sutured on the eye surface. This is an example of a uh, ciliary body, uh, ciliocorridal uh, huge melanoma. After the, the irradiation with the uh, iodine plaque, here the, 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 the scar is uh, not visible because it's far in, in the periphery and the patient is uh, as well. This is an example of a retinium plaque and uh, irradiation before and after the retinium. And these uh, pictures came from uh, Anne Chalembourg. So in conclusion, whatever the treatment you use, you can get a nice tumor control. The risk of metastasis either with uh, enucleation bracket therapy or proton beam is equivalent. Uh, and it depends on of the on the TNM classification at onset, the genomic and mutational status of the tumoral cells. Uh, here you can see the price. You can see that the bracket therapy is cheaper than proton beam. But if you can, can combine the, the two techniques, uh, you can provide a very good treatment to the patient. What we need to work now is to, to improve uh, the proton beam. We have uh, some new protocol with uh, uh, what you call flash proton beam. Uh, it's a technique that delivers the doses uh, with uh, better sparing of the normal tissue. But this uh, new uh, proton beam technique is uh, for, for the moment only uh, on mice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, I've got a question. So what's your thought about the gamma knife treatment and, plaque and uh, colloidal melanoma? Uh, uh, the gamma knife is uh, is an external beam uh, radiotherapy, mm -hmm. and there is not only one uh, beam, but many beams, mm -hmm. and all these beams are focused on the melanoma. Mm -hmm. So it's efficient. You can destroy a melanoma, but it's more toxic because you have the toxicity at each uh, point of the beam of each beam. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, you you increase the toxicity by the by the fact that you 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 have many uh, beam that enter in, in the eye uh, instead of one beam with the proton beam. Okay. So it's uh, more toxic. More toxic. 
Marcos. And uh, what's your thought about PDT in cases of small metastatic melanoma or non-pigmented melanoma? Do you use PDT at all or no? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not convinced. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for both of your talks. Thanks for like, your kindness to cover also the talk um, of, um, of Vicky. Yeah, and, I, hope, uh, I hope she's better. I hope she's better as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So uh, we're going now to our next speaker. And uh, we are really greatly honored to have today with us um, Dr. D'Amato. For who doesn't know Dr. D'Amato, founded um, the Ocular Oncology Service at the Royal Liverpool University Hospital and directed this service until 2013. And uh, then he has then invited to renovate the Ocular Oncology Service at the University of California, San Francisco, which he directed this service until 2018. And recently, he has founded also the Ocular Oncology Service at Oxford Eye Hospital. He has been recipient of several international prizes, has published more than 200 peer review articles, 68 reviews, 75 book chapters, and six books. He has served as president of our European Ocular Oncology Group and also of our international society, president of our International Society of Ocular Oncology. Dr. D'Amato will talk to us today about how we could diagnose fatus tumors in adults. Uh, we have occasions where we're wondering if this is choroidal nevus or choroidal melanoma, or some cases we have overlapping features between choroidal nevus and small melanoma. So Dr. D'Amato, enlighten us. <laughs> to you. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for your invitation. We wish you could be here, actually. <laughs> So let's try the screen share. Okay. There we go. Is that okay? Can you see the screen? No, yes. Yeah. So I'm going to speak about diagnosis of adult ocular tumors. And um, um, there are many intraocular tumors which I can't speak about in 20 minutes. And so I'm going to address three questions uh, to differentiate nevus from melanoma, melanoma from metastasis, and metastasis from lymphoma, because those are the really uh, life-threatening conditions. So with regards to distinguishing nevus from melanoma, um, I have um, put together the acronym MOLES, which um, is the lay term for nevi in English. A mole stands for mushroom shape, orange pigment, large size, enlargement of the tumor, and subretinal fluid. Each of these is given a score of zero to two. So mushroom shape has got a, a score of zero if the tumor is flat or dome shaped, it's got a score of one, if there's just a little bit of invasion into the retina, and a score of two, if there's a definite mushroom shape with an overhang. Orange pigment is given a score of zero if it's absent, one, if there's only trace amounts, so a slight dusting, and two, if there's confluent clumps of orange pigment. OCT is useful for distinguishing orange pigment from drusen because with, um, uh, with because orange pigment lipofuscin is anterior to the to the rpe whereas drusen are present under the rpe large size is categorized as small if the diameter is less than 3 diameters and the thickness is less than 1 borderline if the diameter is three to four this diameters, or if the thickness is one to two millimeters, and two as large if the tumor diameter is more than four this diameters, or if the thickness is more than two. Um, color photography, I think, is the best way to look at diameter of these tumors um, because 
with ultrasonography, uh, it's very difficult to tell where the edges are, especially if the tumor is flat. And OCT for very small tumors, if you can see the sclera, is probably more accurate than ultrasonography. And next is enlargement. Um, zero if there's no enlargement, one if there's uncertain enlargement, and two if there's definite enlargement detected by sequential photography. And the best way to notice uh, enlargement is by um, looking at the distances between the margins of the lesion and the adjacent landmarks. And finally, subretinal fluid. Zero if there's no subretinal fluid, even if there is intraretinal edema, that's zero. One, if there's trace amounts of subretinal fluid, visible only on OCT. And two, if there's enough subretinal fluid to be visible ophthalmoscopically. So I've prepared a scoring system. Each of these is scored between one, zero and two, and then you add them all up and um, to get the total score. And if the total score is zero, that's a common nevus present in 6% of the population. And those patients are reviewed by an optometrist or in the community every two years. One, a low risk nevus, you see the patient every 12 months. Two, a high risk nevus, review every six months. And three or more, a probable melanoma, refer urgently to an ocular oncologist. The reason why probable melanoma is firstly because this system is not designed to differentiate between melanomas and metastases and other conditions. And secondly, non-experts may lack the confidence to categorically diagnose melanoma. So I've designed a referral form, which is being used at Oxford Eye Infirmary, where I'm working, and a Morfield's Eye Infirmary. And this form, the PDF, automatically estimates the total score, the diagnosis, and the recommended treatment. And we insist on the referring practitioner sending us a picture of the tumor so that we can triage the patient and perhaps give a report without the patient coming to hospital. And if you want to find out about this, you can Google o Oxford Ocular Moles Service. So here's an example of a common nevus with no risk factors. Proximity of the tumor to the optic disc is not a risk factor for malignancy. Score of one, because it's big. Two, very big, but no retinal detachment or orange pigment, just lots of drusen. And the score of three with confluent orange pigment, subretinal fluid, this is a probable melanoma. And here's another probable melanoma because despite the small size, the tumor has uh, invaded through pigment epithelium and retina to develop a mushroom shape, an early mushroom shape. So you may have heard about the mnemonic to find small ocular melanoma, thickness, fluid, symptoms, orange pigment, an M for melanoma hollow on ultrasound. But the problem is that a lot of people don't have access to very sensitive ultrasonography equipment, or they don't have the skills to, to look at acoustic hollowness on ultrasonography, especially if the tumor is very, very thin. Previously, M represented marginal disc, but since it was found to be insignificant, that's been canceled. So um, the mole system is very useful for distinguishing nevi from melanomas. It's been validated externally and it's doing very well. But there's still some patients who are uncertain and if you give radiotherapy, just in case it's going to cause a lot of ocular morbidity and for these patients, you might want to perform a biopsy. And here's a tumor uh, with, which has been biopsied successfully, even though the thickness is only about 0 0.6 millimeters. So an expert can biopsy very thin tumors. So in summary, um, one way to distinguish nevi from melanomas is to follow the moles system. It only needs uh, color photography and OCT and if possible autofluorescence 
and it's working well. Now we speak about the difference between melanomas and metastases. Uh, melanomas can, if they're amelanotic, can be very similar. They can have leopard spots like metastases, which consist of lipofuscin. Here you can see the autofluorescence. And they can have a slightly wavy surface. The main differences between melanomas and metastases are that the darker on ultrasound than metastases. And on OCT, metastases have got this lumpy surface, which melanomas don't have. And thirdly, with melanomas, you can usually see tumor, you can see blood vessels within the tumor, which you can't see in metastases. Clinical features of metastases, they can be multiple, unlike melanomas, uh, but quite often they are solitary. The color depends on the camera to a large extent, although there is a bit of variation between patients too. And very rarely you can get intraretinal metastases or vitreous metastases or optic disc metastases. Here's a metastasis. You can see the difference between uh, optos and other cameras. There's a medium reflectivity, a lumpy surface, and on autofluorescence, there's this sort of faint stippling. Here are metastases in a patient from a cutaneous melanoma, and um, also metastasis in the, we can't see it there because it's, there, there we are, um, in the caruncle, in the conjunctiva, and in systemic treatments, the metastases have regressed, the lumpy surface has disappeared, the choroidal vessels have come back again, and the caruncular tumor has gone, and the, but there's been whitening of the skin and the, of the lashes. So, as I said, ultrasound is can be useful. The reflectivity is lower on, on in melanomas than in metastases, and melanomas quite often have this mushroom shape, which is very rare with metastases. And when you do have a mushroom shape with metastases, you don't have a dark area in the deep area. Biopsy is very useful, transclerally or transretinally, uh, to distinguish melanoma from metastasis, and perhaps to note to, to, to identify the source of the metastasis, whether it's starting in, in lung or somewhere else, if it's an occult primary. Uh, many do a biopsy only after lots of systemic investigations. If possible, I prefer biopsy first, and then the result guides the investigations afterwards. Finally, I'm going to speak about metastasis versus, versus lymphoma. They can look quite similar occasionally. Um, lymphomas uh, are large, uh, high-grade diffuse large B-cell lymphomas and with a, with a multi-lobulated nucleus. And they spread from an unknown source, perhaps bone marrow, to the CNS, the eye, and sometimes to the testis. Um, this is my um, understanding of how the ocular disease for vitreoretinal lymphoma develops. First, it spreads through the retinal arterioles into the retina, and sometimes you can see sheathing. And I suspect this because when you see that, you get occlusion of the retinal arterioles and so you see the subpigment epithelial, the pigment epithelial abnormalities everywhere except where you get that protective vascular occlusion. From the retina, the tumor cells pass through the pigment epithelium until they reach the Brooks membrane, and then they get stuck at Brooks membrane, and then they accumulate between the pigment epithelium and Brooks membrane. Quite a few people have told me how can lymphoma cells pass through the pigment epithelium. But you can get the same phenomenon with retinoblastoma. Apart from traveling through the pigment epithelium into the subpigment epithelial space, these cells infiltrate the vitreous to form uh, pearls and clouds. And from the vitreous, they can go back into the retina again. 
or else they can go into the anterior chamber. So the clinical features are these uh, subpigmented epithelial, oops, uh, subpigment epithelial um, deposits, which are hyper autofluorescent. But then when they regress, they cause atrophy of the pigment epithelium, which is hypo autofluorescent. And then uh, you, the vitreous infiltrates also cause clouding in color photography and autofluorescence imaging. And uh, the lymphoma, lymphomas, vitreous lymphomas tend to cause these kinds of patterns. OCT is very useful. Here you can see intraretinal infiltrates with lymphoma and subretinal and pre-pigment epithelial infiltrates, subpigment epithelial infiltrates between the pigment epithelium and Brooks membrane. And then if under the fovea, you can get fibrosis. You can also get macular edema and epiretinal membranes in these patients. So, one way to diagnose these is to do a subpigment epithelial biopsy, but these big masses mostly consist of necrotic tissue. And so it's important to take the sample as deep as possible, as close to the chorea capillaris as possible. And it's really important to get the specimen to the laboratory within an hour, unless you use a special fixative. And then uh, for vitreous biopsies and even subretinal biopsies, you look, look for infectious agents, even histochemistry to identify the cells, the clonality studies, cytokines, gene translocations, look for in infectious agents, and mutations such as MYD88. And in San Francisco, uh, they've developed this metagenomic deep sequencing, which is wonderful because it, it distinguishes uh, DNA from humans, as in lymphoma, from DNA from infectious organisms. And uh, it, 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 it is successful even with tiny amounts. So I think we'll be hearing more about this in the future. So in conclusion, to distinguish nevus from melanoma, you may want to try the MOLES acronym and scoring system. And if that doesn't, uh, using OCT, autofluorescence, sequential color photo photography, and um, perhaps biopsy in some cases. To distinguish melanoma from metastasis, OCT is very useful, ultrasound and biopsy in selected cases. And to distinguish metastasis from lymphoma, OCT is very useful, fundus autofluorescence, really useful, and biopsy uh, is, is extremely useful in that condition. So I'd like to thank my past and present colleagues and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dr. D'Amato. As always, your talks are always very interesting. Uh, I've got a question from you, from Dr. Uh, Andreas Papandroulis. He was asking if there are any risk from biopsy to differentiate melanoma from metastasis. Uh, do we need a special care for biopsy? What risk are you referring to? Um, to, di to differentiate melanoma from metastasis. Right, the important thing is to get a good sample, to take several samples so that you get enough for the uh, pathologist, so that the pathologist can do immunohistochemistry. That's really, really important. Mm -hmm. And if they find that it's a melanoma, then it's very, very useful for them to do genetic analysis to determine whether or not the tumor has got metastatic potential. And is there any special care for biopsy needed or no? For biopsy? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's important um, to consult the pathologist before doing the, the, bi the biopsy to make sure that they're ready for the specimen, that you've agreed on the transport medium uh, and all those kinds of things, especially if you biopsy uh, suspected lymphoma. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of... Um, of people who are afraid that, that the biopsy might disseminate tumor yeah. to liver to cause metastasis. Well, metastasis is a very, very complex phenomenon. And um, it's unlikely that the physical manipulation will actually uh, make the 
blood cell, the tumor cells go into the blood and from the blood to the liver and so on. But the, the biopsy, if it's not done properly, can cause local seeding. I've seen seeding into the subconjunctival tissues and I've seen seeding even into the retina. So I've got to avoid local seeding. Okay. And um, they were asking again about the risks of biopsy. Um, well, I've spoken about the local seeding. I've spoken that I've said that, that uh, biopsy does not cause metastasis of melanoma and metastasis and lymphoma. Mm -hmm. uh, one risk is that um, patients might be afraid of that. And if they do get metastatic disease, they might say it's because of the biopsy. Yeah. And so it's important to speak to the patient before doing the biopsy mm -hmm. to explain to them about the safety of the biopsy. Thank you very, very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Hope you thank you very much. So uh, we're going to our next speaker. It's my very great pleasure to welcome Dr. Sahar Frenkel, who will talk to us about the tumors of anterior segment. Dr. Frenkel is professor of ophthalmology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and chief of the ocular oncology department uh, of Hadassah Medical Center. Among all the other things, he has a research laboratory that employs molecular uh, biology techniques to study the genetic procedures that cause ocular malignancies and metastasis from the tumors of the ocular surface in order to improve the diagnosis of these tumors and to better treat them. Sahar, I'm so happy to see you because I know that you had an emergency this morning and you tried your best to be here, so I'm very happy to see you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it was indeed a really tiresome day, but I managed to make it at the last moment. And we're happy for this. Also because uh, I care about you so much and I didn't want to disappoint you. I'm going to share your screen. Slides. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to talk about, we're going to talk now about uh, conjunctival tumors. And as Professor D'Amato said before me, there is a whole variety which I cannot cover everything, but I put here a set of slides of the highlights of uh, what you would, could be interested in. And so, the important thing is, first of all, to realize where are we in the eye? And if we look in the image here, we see the eyelids and the, next to them, uh, we see the conjunctiva lining, which also covers the eye. And it is important to remember the conjunctiva is not only what we see uh, when the patient opens their eyes. But basically, when we talk about ocular surface epithelial tumors, we're talking about acanthosis thickening of the epithelium uh, with intraepithelial dysplasia, with uh, changes that you can see here on the right, ranging from squamous papilloma, or you see the histology, through conjunctival intraepithelial neoplasia, which can be mildly atypical or severely atypical. The premalignant epithelial lesions, the CIN, can transform into squamous cell carcinoma, uh, which is malignant. And uh, in a few slides, you will see why it's important to distinguish between them. But in the histology slide here, you see the transition from normal epithelium to thickened acantotic uh, dysplastic epithelium. It is very clear to see histologically, as you can see in these pictures clinically, although clinically you don't always see the full extension of the lesion. It can start anywhere in the uh, epithelium and uh, if it covers the cornea. Uh, I'm not sure you can see this here, but there's some haze on the superior half of the cornea here because all the epithelium here is irregular. And if you put fluorescein, you see all this irregular epithelium. The severity of the thickness of epithelium involved determines the severity of the CIN, be it mild, moderate, or severe. When it's full thickness, just like here, then we call it carcinoma in situ, squamous cell carcinoma in situ. 
And squamous carcinoma in satu uh, entails when the dysplastic cells invade through the epithelial basement membrane deep into the underlying stroma. And you can see a wide variety of what these lesions may look like. However, when something looks very similar to it, but in histology, you see foamy cells and you see pagetoid spread. You see islets of cells spreading throughout with sometimes skip lesions throughout the epithelium. Then we're talking about sebaceous carcinoma, which is a completely different entity. And if you have a good suspicion, you have to ask your pathologist specifically about this because dermatopathologists who are not ophthalmic pathologists may sometimes miss these diagnoses. And I've just seen a case like this this week. And why do we have to send every lesion that we remove from the conjunctiva to pathology? Because we've seen cases of quote unquote recurrent pterygium, which were actually OSSA, ocular surface squamous neoplasia. And they were on the severe spectrum of it. And there were squamous cell carcinoma, which eventually invaded into the eye, surrounded the eye and filled the orbit and ended up in exenteration. So, even if you're sure this is a pterygium, please send it to pathology to be sure that this was only a pterygium. If you want to be sure, you can have a small assistance from a simple dye called toluidine blue. Uh, two papers from 2013 and 2015 have shown the, uh, that a high range of uh, pre-malignant and malignant lesions stain with a toledine blue. However, this is not a very specific staining. You put a dot on the eye, you can see the patient here, uh, there is a spillage of uh, this dye outside. Even if you put only one drop, you have to warn the patient in advance that uh, they will uh, come out looking like you punch them in the eye. So tell them in advance and tell them it comes off with water and some soap. But uh, this is very helpful because you can see it stains the epithelium. 90, in one study, 90% of uh, pre-malignant lesions and 100% of malignant lesions stand with 0.1% to lead in blue. In another study, using only 0.05%, they had 92% sensitivity and only 31% specificity, meaning if it's positive, it's worthwhile to take the lesion out. It doesn't mean that it will necessarily be malignant, but if it's positive and you, if it's negative, you have 88% of negative predictive value. If it's negative, probably it's not malignant. Now I want to give a little time to talk about how you send those specimens to pathology because this is really important. If you don't do it correctly, the pathologist cannot help you. And the whole purpose of a biopsy, and Professor Domato also talked about biopsies and how you should procure them, but he didn't speak about how you send them away to the pathologist. And especially in ocular surface lesions, this is extremely important because you see here before you an example of what you shouldn't receive. This is crunched up tissue, squashed by the forceps here. You can't tell where the epithelium is. You can't give a diagnosis. You don't know what the margins are like. And this is just like junk material. What you want to see are all the layers and how will you get to do that? So first of all, if you have a part over the cornea, you have to remove it. And here you see pictures uh, of a colleague who uses a crescent blade. This is something I want to discourage you from ever doing to something that is even remotely suspicious of being malignant. Because if you use a crescent blade, you do not follow the normal planes of the tissue. You create new planes. While doing that, if this was a malignant lesion and it recurs, it will invade into the stroma of the cornea, and you will never be able to remove it. So what I recommend using is a hockey blade. 
you see it down here and you see a magnification of the tip, although it looks sharp, it is not sharp. And you use it to scrape the tissue away. Some others suggest using alcohol over the lesion to loosen the hemidesmosomes connecting the epithelium to the basement membrane and thus loosening the epithelium from the uh, underlying tissue and then you can remove intraepithelial lesions. By the way, if it doesn't help either with alcohol or with a hockey blade, it means that you already have invasion. So you have a very good clinical suspicion in the operating room without seeing the pathology that this would be a malignant lesion. But after you've removed the epithelial part, you have to remove the, the you remove the corneal part, you have to remove the conjunctival part. Once you do that, you have to spread the tissue very well. So you will not have crunched up tissue. <clears throat> we use the paper that wraps the gloves, the surgical glove which you receive, you cut a square of it and you place, usually you have a piece of cardboard to show you as an indicator that everything is sterile in your kit. And you can use this cardboard to spread the tissue over it. Or if you use a wax sponge like in the picture here on the left, you can spread the tissue on the wax sponge cut away the sponge from the stick and put it in the paper. And then you fold the paper over the tissue, fold it nicely, and you put this in the formalin container. If you keep this, the tissue will be fixed flat. And then you will be able to see the entirety of the lesion. Moreover, it is important to tell the, your pathologist where you took this from. And so the pathologist will know who are the margins and he will be able, or he, she will be able to tell you if you have invasion of which margin. If you do it right, this is what it comes out. Like you see a very nice flat lesion. So once we know how to take these lesions out, we're gonna move to the ocular surface pigmented lesions. And you have a whole variety of them ranging from ocular melanosis, which isn't really in the conjunctiva, through complexion-related melanosis, which is in people with darker skin tone, used to be called racial melanosis, but then someone said if all the pathologists were from African ancestry, then people like me would have conjunctival amelanosis, racial amelanosis. So they changed the terminology, uh, and now it's complexion-related melanosis. When you have darker complexion, you may have this uh, pigmentation on your conjunctiva, usually only in the horizontal plane in, at three and nine o'clock. Nevi many, many times have cysts in them. And if you see cysts inside such a lesion in the conjunctiva, this is a really good indication that this lesion is benign. Then we move to pre-malignant lesions such as primary acquired melanosis. And they come in two varieties, without and with atypia. Clinically, you cannot discern between them. Primary acquired melanosis without a TPA usually looks like someone took a container of a cinnamon dust and sparkled it, peppered it over the conjunctiva. You see fine grainy uh, patches of pigment. Uh, when there is a TPA, in many cases, it is more widespread, and sometimes you have darker areas as well. And this range of non-malignant lesions ends with conjunctival melanoma, which you see in the bottom picture. Now, I put this caroncular lesion here under nevus because this specifically is a nevus, but this is a very dangerous location. If this is not a nevus and a melanoma, this is much more likely, just like the tarsal conjunctiva, a pigmented lesion in this location is more likely to be a melanoma than a nevus and must always be removed, especially if this is a new lesion. Now, when we look at PAM, not all the melanocytes produce melanin. So here I show you with a blue margin, the entire extent of this PAM. Although clinically, initially, you only see pigmentation in a very limited area. So you have to remove this lesion. Histologically, 
you see the difference between non, uh, non atypia, which look like a variety of nuts arranged on a windowsill or on a tabletop. They, all the nuclei look a bit different, but they are all lined one next to the other. Once they start clumping one on top of the other, then you get atypia. Here in this histological picture, you see severe atypia. But still not all of these melanocytes may produce melanin. So you don't always see the entire extent of it. So if you want to do a complete excision, it is not always possible because you cannot detect the margins. So there are two techniques of how to approach this problem. But before that, I will tell you a few more things about melanoma, which also has to be resected in the same way because of the same issue of non-pigmented melanocytes. The annual incidence of conductival melanoma is very low. It's only 0.2 to 0.3 per million uh, cases a year. And most of them, two thirds of them arise from primary acquired melanosis with atypia. Only 20% arise from nevi and the rest are de novo. Conductival melanoma is about one to 500 less common than skin melanoma. But still, it is an important disease to remember. Not always do you see the melanoma. For example, this patient looks completely normal when he comes to you. But if you invert the eyelid, you see this very serious mess of melanoma on the tarsal conductiva. So any suspected pigmentation that you see on the bulbar conductiva, you must invert the eyelids. And I would suggest that you avert every eyelid of a new patient that you see, even if you don't see any pigmentation. Speaking about conjunctival melanoma versus skin melanoma, then there is a common mutation, a BRAF mutation. It is present in about 50% of nevi, doesn't appear at all in primary acquired melanosis, be it with or without atypia, and appears in 40% of conjunctival melanomas. So it is not really useful in diagnosing melanoma because this could also be a nevus. But we should remember that this is closer to skin melanoma than uvel melanoma. Invasion deep into the tissue varies between 0.8 to 4 millimeters resulting in a decreased trend in prognosis without a clear cutoff value. In skin melanoma, you, there is a cutoff value. In conjunctival, there isn't. Local recurrence has been reported in about 50% of patients after about two and a half years. So what about, so what do you do with it? If you don't know how to remove everything. So there's one technique called the no touch technique, where as you can see here in A, you take very wide margins, about four millimeters around the lesion, and then you do cryo of all the margins and the tumor bed. And then if you have a large enough gap that you cannot close, you put an amniotic membrane to help close it. The surgical results are okay. Another management uh, technique is to use strontium plaques. Uh, these are uh, beta radiation plaques. You put it for a few minutes on the lesion and you finish the radiation. However, if you do cryotherapy, there ver there's a long list of risks. You risk simplephone, coronal edema and scarring, vascularization, iritis, peripheral iris atrophy, uh, IOP changes, peripheral retinal changes, cataract, ectropion. So this is why we do not do this technique. We prefer to use either brachytherapy, but strontium plaques are only available in, there's one in London, maybe one in, in Moscow, but in most places you don't have them. And it doesn't help you differentiate between all those other lesions. By the way, a benign inflamed juvenile conjunctival lesion does not need this, but the melanoma will. So we prefer to use adjuvant local therapy and you can do it with chemotherapy like mitomycin C uh, with 0.02% for epithelial lesions and 0.03% for, uh, 
for pigmented lesions. The downside of this is that you get, with repeated treatments, you get limbal stem cell ischemia, a limbal stem cell deficiency. A five fluorouracil is mostly used in Italy. And interferon alpha 2b or alpha 2a is uh, useful, and I'll show you in a minute. And plaque brachytherapy over the lesion. Uh, one of the great promoters of plaque brachytherapy over these lesions was Professor Domato, who spoke before me. Uh, regarding the local chemotherapy, it is good for intraepithelial lesions, be them a CIM, even up to carcinoma in situ, but not good for invasive squamous cell carcinoma. And it is good for primary acquired melanosis with atypia, but not for invasive malignant melanoma. In these cases, you must put a plug. If it is not invasive, you can use interferon. Look at this. This patient was treated with multiple treatments of uh, mitomycin C, kept having recurrences, and then she was treated with interferon. And look at the clearing of all the pigmentation from her bulbar and tarsal conjunctiva and the eyelid margin, everything went away. So this is very effective immunotherapy against melanoma. When you talk about brachytherapy, we use ruthenium plaques in comparison to iodine plaques. Those are very large. I don't know how anyone can put them over the conjunctiva. They're really too big and they will interfere with closure of the eyelids. And ruthenium plaques are so thin, it doesn't bother the patient to close the eye. You put them, you make two holes in the conjunctiva, suture the plaque to the sclera and you're done. But what happens if it's the tarsal conjunctiva? There's a convexity of the plaque and it is the reverse of the convexity of the tarsus. So I've invented a surgical technique which I call sandwich technique. You put, you see this uh, at the bottom left corner, you see this conjunctival melanoma and the tarsal conjunctiva. You slip the radioactive plaque facing the tarsus, but you don't want to irradiate everyone around them. So you use the demi plaque on the other side and you suture them together. And then you block all the radiation coming from the plaque only the eyelid tumor gets radiated. So in this sandwich technique, you manage to treat even tarsal conjunctival lesions. And so I hope that with this uh, quick tour of uh, conjunctival epithelial and pigmented tumors and treatment options and why I personally advocate some treatment modalities over others, uh, I hope this helps. I hope you remember the pathology tips, so your pathologist appreciates how you send in tissue and then you get better pathology reports to help you diagnose and treat your patients. Thank you very much for your attention and for staying this late. And I transfer the microphone back. Thank you very, very much, uh, Sahar. Your talk was very, very interesting. Um, I've got a question for you. Um, do you think um, as a diagnostic procedure UBM or anterior segment OCT would be more useful in the diagnosis of ocular tumors? What would you use and um, in which condition? Or if you have to prefer one? So I actually uh, forgot to put a slide of the uh, anterior segment uh, or ultrasound and OCT into my presentation due to uh, this emergency this morning. Um, so you but can answer it now. If you have any suspicion that a squamous cell carcinoma or a conjunctival a, a melanoma is invasive into the eye, you would use anterior segment ultrasound. But if you're only looking about the epithelium and, and the minor invasion of non very thick lesions, then anterior segment OCT is wonderful. Okay. And uh, if we in have case another conjunctival patient, lymphoma, well, lymphoma, I'm not sure this would be helpful in the anterior segment at all. Uh, lymphoma looks salmon patch. Uh, you differentiate lymphoma from inflammation uh, by a biopsy, and you have to have a very good pathologist uh, specialized in lymphoma to differentiate these lesions, and so. Um, to differentiate lymphoma, you have to have a biopsy. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us this evening. And uh, I hope that this course today addresses some of the issues relating to the fields of ocular oncology. Thank you to all the speakers for taking the time from their busy schedules uh, to join me for this occasion. And a huge thanks for all the participants. Εύχομαι κάθε επιτυχία στη συνέχεια του συνεδρίου ε, και κυρίως εύχομαι αυτή η παγκόσμια δοκιμασία της πανδημίας να τελειώσει σύντομα και να μπορέσουμε στο άμεσο μέλλον να μοιραστούμε τη γνώση αλλά και συνδυασμό όμως με το πολύ ακριβό αγαθό της άμεσης επικοινωνίας.